Okay. So my first top pick is The Trial of the Chicago 7. So the film's based on the infamous 1969 trial of seven defendants charged by the federal government with conspiracy arising from the protests at the Chicago Democratic National Convention in 1968. So it was initially the Chicago 8 because Bobby Seale was part of that. But ultimately his, I think he had a mistrial. Gosh, it sounds really bad. I don't recall exactly. But they were all eight initially arrested and charged with inciting a riot. So the protesters say the police incited and the prosecution obviously say the Chicago 8 came to Chicago with the sole purpose of inciting a riot not to protest. And the trial is about that. Now, I wasn't familiar with this. Um, apparently, though, it's an important trial in free speech. And the, the now I can't remember who it was. It was one person who's still alive. And he said it was very true. He thought true to the story. I mean, I, I thought Bobby Seale was going to play a bigger role based on the trailer and he kind of left midway. So I lost, <laughs> I lost a bit of interest, to be honest, <laughs> midway, especially, you know, they feature Fred Hampton too, which is long overdue for the Hollywood treatment of a story, but then maybe not because it might turn into a birth of a nation situation. Uh, but which maybe we shouldn't would cover that too because i enjoyed birth of a nation however i thought there were some key things in there mm-hmm. that really that weren't true that i think put in a bit of an mm-hmm. anti-black message nothing to do with nate parker because and that's the thing i hate to say because it seems like uh the director nate parker went through so much to get that film made so i would hate to say anything yeah. negative about it given given all he went through and then of course the way he was treated on the well, after that. Yeah, yeah, that was that was awful. So yeah, maybe maybe we won't do that film. And uh, well, no, maybe we should though, because I think the real story should be told. We'll think about it. But uh, it was still an interesting story to think about how the different tactics were discussed, because one was all about politics, saying you have to get people, you have to get elected officials in office, you have to change policy. That's the only way forward. And the other, I believe, was Abby Hoffman. No, it's about changing the culture. And I think we still have that central argument today. So the two of the films that we are going to talk about today are Little White Lie and The Imposter. So which one would you like to start with? How about The Imposter? Because I haven't actually watched Little White Lie, so I'll be intrigued to hear what you've got to say about it. Well, actually, no, I was actually more concerned about The Imposter because my question to you is going to be more as a mother, right? Since you are a mother, I've only been a child, so I can, but you can see it from a mother's perspective if Layla goes missing and comes back with brown eyes, will that be Layla? So, so not quick synopsis. The Imposter is a 2012 documentary about the 1997 case of French confidence trickster Frédéric Bourdin, who impersonated Nicholas Barclay, a Texas boy who disappeared at the age of 13 in 1994. So the story opens with the imposter. They, and I think it's so well done the way they did the documentary. It just really draws you in because they combine the story with Frédéric narrating and being being interviewed but providing a narration and then they're reenacting as he tells the story although there were some jerks who said oh i couldn't tell if it was real how could there be footage of that (laughs) okay it was clear you know the shot was clear and this was in the 90s so how would that have happened like him telling the story of going to an orphanage from spain who would have shot that although they anyway will very well done i it's one of those documentaries, in my opinion, that makes you say, wow, I wish I had a story to tell like that because I couldn't find any fault in the way they shot it, the way they told the story, especially something so complicated. They kept it uh, time wise an hour and 40 minutes, which mm-hmm. I thought was extraordinary. Yeah, Succinct. Yeah. yeah, to be able to do that. And like I said, the story didn't the way they brought in characters, you just. You could just jump right in on it. Mm-hmm. And so. What happens is he impersonates young people to get access to welfare services. And in one case, though, the questions, it gets a little bit too hot and he tries to figure out an identity, another one that he can use, a real person, to continue to get services. But this time he makes a mistake and he is impersonating someone from the U.S. and it's 
what happens from there because it actually ends up working out for him. So of course the question then becomes, this is going to be full of spoilers. The sister has to fly to Europe to go pick him up. Now, Nicholas Barkley, the boy who he's impersonating at this time would have been 17, right? 16, 17. So he disappeared in 1994. They find him in 1997. Now, Frederic, his mother is a white French woman. His father is Algerian. Is it Algerian or Moroccan? Algerian, I think. So Frederic, although we know you're going to get people, oh, they can come out any kind of way. Yes, I get that. But he very much looks like he is from (laughs) that part of the world. So he's, you know, olive skin, brown hair, brown eyes. Being from the U.S., you would not mistake him for... A white man. Well, I guess depending what part of the U.S. you're from. If you're not from Florida right, or California, you're not going to make that mistake. OK, not only that, more importantly, Nicholas has blonde hair and blue eyes when he disappears. Now, we do know that children's hair color can change. So the brown hair, possibly the skin and the eyes. No. And yet the sister accepts him as her brother. So then the question becomes. Is it fraudulent where she's desperate for anyone to be her brother because they're trying to cover something up that happened to Nicholas Barkley or is it denial Mm -hmm. and I think that's just the overall question and I really left the documentary saying I don't know because I don't want to believe that the family did something to this boy at the same time as much as I joke about wanting to be an only child, I can't imagine my sister disappearing and picking up a light-skinned black woman with green eyes and bringing her back home, (laughs) right? And I wanted to get rid of her as well. And I'd be desperate to have her back. Then, of course, you have the guilt, like, wow, I always wish she'd be gone. And now she is. Ah, But perhaps denial and really intense depression and desperation could do that to you yeah it could I think the documentary at least the filmmaker somewhere was leaned towards suspecting the family of being behind his disappearance and I refer you to the not so subtle shot at the end of a spade planted in the garden (laughs) no that and that's and that was interesting too so the person when he comes, so as we've said, Frederic is French. Nicholas is yeah. from Texas. Frederic is, he's an actor, but he's not that good an actor. So he cannot <laughs> pretend to have an American a very accent. Very strong French accent. Yes. <laughs> vi- yes. He, but although his English is, is excellent, that's also a stereotype and it played out here. His English is excellent. And yet... You would not think he was an American because it's also the Americanisms. It's the way you speak, especially imagine a teenager in Texas. They'd be riddled with all sorts of things, although his story was that he'd been kidnapped and been away. But nevertheless, you would still have a particular pattern of speech. It's all so implausible. Well, the pattern of speech, everything. So I remember there was one bit where he attributed the change, the the change in eye color to stress, I think. (laughs) (laughs) post-traumatic stress disorder or experiments they did on him that was yeah 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 right i think it was some experiment something it was something crazy something so crazy you're like huh (laughs) but that's what you mean it's like he has some stories but that's what i was i would i'd be interested to know so in the end do you feel sympathetic towards him because i think what what the documentary does is elicit sympathy for him and well, that's something that the documentary disorder. filmmaker went out of his way to do because he actually says in an interview that um he inv- well i'm quoting right i saw this in an interview but that he invites sympathy he has this childlike quality about him and he can be very charming and yeah, at other times artist. he can be quite repellent because he can be remorseless and you're reminded of what he did um, so as a filmmaker, I was asking, how can I find a way of getting the audience to experience a bit of that? And I actually think he's very successful in doing that um, because not only does he elicit quite a lot of sympathy for uh, Baudin, but even his more remorse, his remorselessness actually comes off as more daring and ballsy than just purely sadistic. You're like, oh, well, that's impressive. I mean, 
you really pulled that out of your ass really and all the excuses that he gave were so impressive in just how bonkers they were but I also I think this is largely due to the fact that he wanted to suggest that the family was behind it but we're trying to also come up with a plausible explanation right because you want to and it's not a way to play a devil's advocate it's a way to think just have some empathy and say how could you be in their position now I think Frederick he certainly he certainly is pretty much of a, a monster because what he does is he is impersonating these missing children so giving families false hope I mean you you can't yeah. get much worse than that that's pretty bad uh so I but that but that's just it but that's all car and artists are charming and he has to have a personality about him that's how he lures mm-hmm. people in that's how you want to be friends with him he knows how to be what he needs to be at the time but there's something i don't know if you felt that but there was something jarring in the fact that he was a con artist because he came across in the documentary as very naive there was something very no no but maybe that's how the image he and i think a mix of that and the fact that genuinely because he did it to get welfare to get social services to support him I ended up feeling sorry for him. No, I, I do know what you mean. But but that's just, it's like, I I would have felt that if he hadn't actually impersonated real missing ch- Because that's the problem, right? Ultimately, he should, no one should have to <laughs> live like that. And that's a common complaint you hear about people saying like, well, that's why they're against welfare because they see people get benefits and they don't get them and it's like well no that's the reason to expand it not to restrict <laughs> restrict yeah. it right that's why you say we need more of it and of course he's a prime example of that like he should never have been backed into a corner because why should he not get housing and live rough because he's over 18 or 21 you know whatever they set the limit yeah, at. i don't yeah. know when he starts yeah. impersonating real children, though, and playing with the emotions of family, that's when it, it crosses the line. Because I, yeah. I just think there's a way to not... And that's why he did it in different places, right? That's why he was serial, because it didn't seem like he did that all the time. So mm-hmm. it seems like once he was had no option except for to come up with a, a, a real family, because that was the problem in... And we didn't mention that, actually. I don't think my... <laughs> My synopsis was very good. So what happened was he had been, and so he he was a serial impersonator of children and he knew how to act very young. So he was in his early twenties, but he would impersonate teenagers in their late teens in order to get to the youth hostel and get enrolled in school and get housing, some security. However, in this situation, it seems like that was kind of the M.O. that they ultimately want to have family reunification. And there was a lot of pressure to get the details of his family. And that is how he came up with becoming Nicholas, because he had to produce a family. He had to produce people looking for him in order to legitimate his claim on these services. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like before he would leave and then start the process all over again somewhere else which i would have preferred yeah. him to do than to play with these people's pain at the same time and that's why it's just it, it begs so many questions because it seems like when he was doing that it never would go past him calling people and impersonating them because you can't no. do it in person for obvious reasons so the fact that in this way i mean he got a passport do you hear what i'm saying he got a passport and luckily i mean i guess it's the only time you'd ever say that luckily there was a racist <laughs> officer of the law who said mm, something is wrong here we have a terrorist he saw that brown skin and that accent is that terrorist there's something happening here. Although they, I, I don't know. And I, it is bizarre that he thinks a terrorist would come to that small town, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're a terrorist, I believe you want to be inconspicuous. That's step number one. <laughs> you don't you don't blend in impersonating a white teenager as a brown man. But hey, that was his logic. And it Who was to argue with that. Yeah, exactly. But no, I I didn't think he was trying to. I mean, I didn't get that impression that the director was trying to paint a sympathetic character. If anything, I think he wanted to make him a person as opposed to uh, because we have 
a character in mind, right? We definitely depersonalize someone when we say mm-hmm. a con artist. It's like they take yeah. advantage of good yeah. people. We have the con artists, we have a, have good people. And that's, I think, the line he was trying to take away. It's like, no. Okay. No, you're right. You're right. Apologies. I should have. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's no, his, no, his, no. We, we can have different opinions. We don't have to. No, but I, I agree. It's, it's humanizing him. Uh, but he didn't have, what I meant was he didn't have a particular agenda, racks to grind about him being responsible he his focus was also on the family's role in the matter that's the thing he wasn't it wasn't a documentary purely about a con artist it was also a documentary about this family and what they're how they're interpreting that situation how they're Mm -hmm. dealing with it and what it might or might not hide and and i think and the key piece about that too we should add is that the his story got the attention of the FBI. And so mm-hmm. they had to investigate. Now he was taken by an agent to see a psychologist because he was making the circuit, the TV circuit talking about all of these awful things that had happened in as part of, because his story of how he left Texas was that he was part of this international sex ring with boys. Yeah, So really horrific stuff he was coming up with of what happened to him and go making the rounds on tv which that was he was begging to get caught then you think well, he yeah, would have just it. said that's i don't want to talk about it there's something but, that feels very earnest about what he was doing because you'd think surely surely you don't believe this is gonna you're gonna you're gonna get away with this it, well it was believable though because yeah, everyone believed his story some... even the fbi agent we should add believed his story she totally believed it yeah. And the only thing that raised the question was she took him to a psychologist and once the psychologist met him because he knows understands child development, he said there is no way that this kid is an American because of the way he speaks English. Mm-hmm. So he immediately drew that conclusion. So the FBI agent then calls the sister and says, "I don't know who this is, but this is not your brother. So we'll take it from here because they flew somewhere." to see the psychologist, the FBI agent and Frederic. Yeah. So when, and this is according to the FBI agent. Okay. This is the story she's telling. So then she said, leave it with me. You don't have to interact with this individual. We will figure it out. Then when they come to the airport, she said the sister was there. And she was like, what? And she called the agency because she didn't know what to do. She's like, is he dangerous? Should I take him with me? And they said, which was also weird, they said, oh, just just let him go with her. And they were going to do their due diligence on their end, which also raised it's like, oh, my, he could have been anybody. But I guess she figured, hey, she came to pick him up and less work and money for us. So we'll just let, let him go home with her. And the sister then said she didn't recall that. And that's not something you would forget. That's not a conversation that you would forget. If you had it. So, but then of course, what incentive would the FBI agent have to lie? Unless of course, but it's also possible maybe she didn't say it. And then looking back, she realizes that that was a dangerous situation. She put the family in and now she has to say that she told her that. What happened was after the psychologist visit, she, Mm -hmm. the FBI agent says that she called the sister and she told her, this is not your brother. This is a stranger based on the psychologist's okay. finding and don't pick him up from the airport. And when she arrives back in Texas, the sister is at the airport to collect him. Yes. The sister says that she does not recall that conversation. So someone's lying because that is not a conversation you'd forget. So either the FBI agent told her that or she didn't. But I, but that's just what, that's another thing I think that makes the story so compelling is nobody's a reliable character, really. Narrator, I mean, character. No one is reliable. Frederic certainly has his reasons no, for lying. Yeah. The sister and the mom certainly have their reasons for lying. Uh, nobody. I would argue the FBI agents don't really have much reason for lying. I think they do because you don't want to be liable for anything that happened. And then, it, oh, it, but it also yeah. still goes back to the family. Like, how how could you look at that man and think that was your brother? And you, there's yeah. just no getting around that. And yeah. as a mother, you know, as a mother now, <laughs> Abla, that's why I think because I've asked several mothers who I've mm-hmm. begged to watch this, 
even my own mom. And that is what she couldn't get around. Like, I know my kids. Mm, I think it depends on what kind of person you are. As you know, I'm very, very easily persuaded by other people. I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't be able to pronounce you. I would, yes, you you would say that, but then Mm -hmm. what exactly would be the double impact of both grief, a maddening grief and a genuine fear of not believing that person just in case there's a tiny chance this person is indeed your child. That kind of goes back to the other question too, with the officials, why on earth, like how did that get past them? Well, exactly. That's it. What struck me is that they just willingly accept that version of events. They never really question it at all. There would be some level of incredulity where you're like, this is, am I willing to believe that small chance that it might be right? Yeah, but that's what I mean. That's why this documentary was so well done because yeah. you just... Yeah, and, and the other thing too, right, in terms of the family doing something to him... Mm-hmm. I would also think it'd be easier. It's always easier to have someone missing than someone fake show up. So surely what would be their reason for having him there versus having him a runaway? Because nobody was looking for him anymore. So let's say they had done something to him. They got away with it. So it would have been better for them to leave it as that versus bringing in an imposter or a substitute, we should say. So, I mean, no one's looking for him. Well, yeah, also because now there's a a bigger spotlight shed on (laughs) the disappearance of the boy right absolutely and disappearance you would like to think there's no way i would accept someone especially he was yeah he was brown like and they're in texas and so any conclusive remarks about the imposter it's an oldie but goodie so it's from 2012 so gosh pretty soon it will be a decade old but it is so worth the watch (laughs) uh (laughs) Oh, I wonder what he's I... up to these days. Oh, Frederick? Him up. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I totally looked it up. So, of course, he has Don't. like three or four kids, but his wife left him. So now he's a single dad. Aww. And he's still really into Michael Jackson. And so his kids sing his <laughs> <dance> too. <laughs> That's a must watch, I think, especially now the holidays are coming up. They'll be, I think, more binge watching. So put it on the list. And now we-